Welcome back to The Garage, guys. Today we're going to be discussing the top 10 mistakes people make when they're building their DIY CNC plasma table. These are things that we've come up with over the past three years uh, that we've ventured down this journey. We're going to get into it right away. So number 10, not understanding the software that's required to build and utilize a CNC plasma table. The first software you need is a CAD software. Second software you need is a CAM software with post-processor. And the third thing you need is a G-code sender. We've got an entire video on that, so I'm not going to go into it on this one, but we've put the video link in the description down below, so check that out. Number nine, believing you wired the machine correctly. This is by far the number one issue we see with our customers. Uh, you may believe you wired it correctly, and you may have wired it correctly, but that doesn't mean all your connections are correct. You may have wire under the insulation or insulation under the lug. You may have a loose connection. Things like that cause problems. One of the things that we would suggest to you is make a little gauge when you strip your wires. Make sure you strip all your wires exactly the same length, and that way you won't get insulation under some of these screw lugs. Number eight, this is a big one, going too big. Everybody thinks they need a machine that's bigger than what they really need. Uh, we originally built our plasma cutter three years ago, and it's got a cutting surface of about 28 by 28, give or take. And uh, we thought that was going to be big enough, and it has been. Over the past three years, this is probably the biggest part we've cut out on a routine basis. We did a couple parts that were bigger for various things, but mainly for YouTube videos, not for something we needed. Everyone thinks they need a big machine, but think about what you're going to use it for. You know, are you going to use it for signs? Are you going to be making four by eight signs? Well, probably not. Are you going to use it for brackets for a, for a build in your garage? Probably. So in that case, most of your brackets are pretty small. You know, a lot of people build the machine way too big and it takes up way too much room in their garage. Number seven, the wrong machine settings and configuration in your controller. No matter what controller you pick to run your machine, there are going to be some machine settings that need to be programmed in or entered into a file. And these types of settings are how far it travels per revolution of each motor and things like that. Those things have to be set properly for your machine to move the proper distance. Uh, in our plans, we give a complete list of what each one of those settings are, so you can double check that against the list. Number six, this is probably specific to our build, but trying to flash the ESP32 with it installed in the machine or in the breakout board. So if this is the ESP32, it's in the breakout board. If it's in your machine where the wire is connected to it, you won't be able to flash it. You have to pull this out and flash it. Once it's flashed, you need to insert it back in to the board. You need to have your jumper hooked up to enter the gerbil settings. But that's a, that's a big problem. If you have to reflash for some reason, you need to pull it out. Number five, over complexity and overspending on the drive system in a DIY, DIY plasma cutter. I want to talk about this in a little more detail than the other points. We're going to start with Hypotherm. Hypotherm is the premier manufacturer of plasma cutters worldwide. And if you go on their website, they list their kerf tolerance as 0.5 millimeters or 20 thousandths of an inch. Now the machine needs to be at least an order of magnitude more precise than that kerf tolerance to ensure that any issues with your cut are in the tooling and not in the machine. So what that equates to would be to two thousandths of an inch tolerance. Now we have a video with our machine showing our machine accuracy down to one thousandth of an inch tolerance. There's various ways to make a, a drive system for a CNC machine. There's rack and pinion, there's belt, there's lead screw, there's ball screw, and a lot of those are out there. And we got a few of them sitting here, so we got an example of a lead screw. This is just gonna screw down, screw down, screw down. With a lead screw, we need, you, I, very tough to tell on camera, but I can feel the play in here. A lead screw has to have something to compensate for backlash in it. So generally there's another nut that follows it and a spring in between that constantly keeps it pressed against that. So your accuracy with a lead screw is based on that spring in there. 
We also have the belt drive system. Now this is a little heavier duty, but you know the the new trapezoidal belts and the gate belts gates belt system that's really revolutionized uh, CNC machines and uh, worldwide. You know, and also with automation, it takes the best of a lot of things, it cheapens it down, and it makes assembly very easy. So that's the method we used. We don't currently have a ball screw, but a ball screw would look something like this, except the grooves would be round, and there would be there would be uh, ball bearings that travel around the lead screw and then return back to the end. As this spins, the balls are going around and around and then they return back to the end. It's just a conveyor belt or like an escalator in there. Uh, ball screws are usually very expensive. A lot of people get a ball screw and a lead screw confused thinking they're the same thing. They're really not. So in any case, with all these options, they're going to be good enough to get down to that two thousandths of an inch tolerance. Now, so then the decision comes from where can I save some money and what's going to be easiest to put on the machine. And, you know, we're kind of partial, but we think the belt system's the best in, of those regards. Number four, spending money on overpriced or outdated software. It's not like it was 15 years ago where if you wanted to build a CNC machine, you had to pay for some type of software like Mach 3. There's plenty of softwares out there today that are actually better and do more things than Mach 3 that are actually free, like Gerbil, Gerbil Hal, Fluid NC. Now these are excellent choices for doing a DIY plasma table. We're not talking about the high-end softwares here that are for professional machines. We're talking about the stuff in the DIY market. Number three, not using shielded cable. This is important. There's a lot of things that leave your electrical box that go out to various things on your CNC plasma machine. Those things need to have a shield on their on the cable. Uh, needs to the shield helps protect against emission and acceptance of electromagnetic interference. Now these controllers are very sensitive. They're often looking for inputs, outputs, things activated, not activated. If that noise is going on, it's going to give phantom switch or phantom switching or non switching. Uh, that's going to cause issues with the control of the machine so using a jacketed cable is very important and buy the jacketed cable buy the proper material don't just use some cable you've had laying around the house and put tinfoil around it we kid you not we have seen people do that number two thinking that gnd v minus and earth are all the same type of grounding i'm going to talk about this for a second so on my controller on the breakout board, there's lots of things listed as GND. What that means is that's zero volts for the five volts here. Power supply, we have a V minus on the power supply. What that means is it's zero volts for here. Those are not the same. There's also an earth, and earth means earth. Earth is a different type of ground. So we've got a ground on our power supply, we've got a ground on our controller, and we have earth. If you're building your own CNC machine, you need to understand what needs to be hooked to what when you do that. If you look at our plans, our schematic, we go through and we've already done that work for you that show you what things have to be hooked to the ground on the GND on the controller, the minus on the power supply, or to earth. And finally, we're down to number one. The biggest mistake you can do when making your DIY plasma cutter is trying to use a high-frequency plasma machine to mount to the cutter. This is just not going to work. Sure, you can go online and read forms about this and forms about that. Somebody made a Faraday cage and somebody did this. Now well, maybe they got it to work, but trust me, you're going to have issues. It's going to cause more problems than, it worth, than it's worth just to get a, the proper plasma cutter. So what is the pro proper plasma cutter? You know, for years, people used to market them as a pilot arc. Well, a pilot arc was a low frequency. Well, people understood that. Now there's pilot arcs that are high frequency. So in the past, a pilot arc was always low frequency. It's not that way anymore. So you need to specifically look when purchasing a plasma cutter that it says low frequency blowback start. And generally, if it has that, it's going to have a CNC port on it. So that's the second thing. If somebody has ever seen a high frequency machine with a... CNC port. I'd like to know about it in the comments below because we want to put that out there. We want to show that that that's not going to work. But generally speaking, low frequency 
blowback start is what you need to see listed in order to have an acceptable plasma cutter that will work with a CNC machine. Now, why do people try and use a high frequency? Well, cost. If you see machines out there for under $200, I can almost guarantee they're gonna be a high frequency machine. To get a low frequency blowback start machine, it's gonna be a hundred or two hundred dollars more than that. So you're gonna be in the high three hundreds to five hundreds to get into the proper machine for a CNC table. Well, thanks a lot for sticking around at the end of the video, guys. I know we tried to cover the top ten, but what we'd like to see from you is what are your other things that you see mistakes that people make when they make a DIY plasma cutter? Go ahead and put those in the comments below and we'll make sure to follow up with you. Thanks a lot for sticking to the end and make sure to like and subscribe.